In 2010, Australian politics was brought to the forefront of the news cycle. Far removed from the sterile memories of the Howard years, the previous three years had been marked by unfettered intrigue. Kevin Rudd, who, at one point, was the most popular PM since polling began, had been replaced by his deputy and factional machinations. The new leader, also Australia's first female Prime Minister, Julia Gillard, immediately sought the mandate of the Australian people, calling for an election to be held in August. This election produced the closest election result in Australian history and put several crossbench MPs in a very powerful position. One such MP, national turned independent Tony Windsor, recalled the negotiations and games that were played during those days of uncertainty. It became very clear that Julia Gillard was the only real choice in that. Uh, Tony Abbott didn't believe in the NBN. The climate change was some sort of hocus pocus thing. Uh, most of the issues I ran on, he disagreed with until a couple of days before the end when he panicked and promised anything we particularly wanted. Oh, that wasn't a, a good basis to make decisions. What made Abbott break down and promise wins of the world? To answer that, we need to develop an understanding of what a minority government is and how it fits into the Westminster system. A little over 800 years ago, King John of England fought what would later become known as the First Barons' War. This led to, among other things, the Magna Carta, which guaranteed... As the axe blade fell, the sovereignty of Parliament was unquestioned forevermore, but misplaced his pants in a hotel outside of Memphis. The parliamentary system operates based on the ability of a government to control and maintain the confidence of the House, as well as being able to legislate for supply of government funds. A government commands this confidence by being able to bring on side more members to support them than those that don't. If a government made up of one party, or a formalised coalition of parties, has enough members to guarantee confidence on its own, then that government is said to be governing in majority. While a government that needs support from non-aligned members, known as the crossbench, in order to maintain confidence, is known as a minority government. Given these crossbenchers can switch their allegiance at any time, and have done so in the past, the position of crossbencher in a minority government is a lucrative one. In the early 1800s, the British Parliament began passing laws which allowed for the colonies of Australia to, in some respects, self-govern, and by 1956 the first Parliament, that of New South Wales, opened and became the first Australian colony with responsible government. Similar Parliaments opened later on in the other colonies. At this time, there was no well-developed party system as we see today. The right to vote was largely restricted to land-owning men, and MPs had no party allegiance. This meant that the government of the day was based on very infirm foundations, often leading to the replacement of premiers several times in a term. This was the case in Victoria and New South Wales, though Queensland's first premier served for almost two terms before falling into the same pitfalls of ephemeral leadership. As time went on, proto-parties mirroring the British status quo began to emerge, with Liberal and Conservative members forming either government or opposition. In the 1890s, Australia would lead where Britain would follow in the formation of organised electoral groups which would come to form the Australian Labour Party, then spelt with a U. In the early colonial period, the practice of plural voting was used, where landholders could vote based on the number of properties they held. This reached an absurd extreme in Britain, where during a debate on abolishing the practice, an MP recounted the story of a clergyman of the Church of England, who has a hobby for acquiring qualifications in different constituencies, has been able to obtain 50 votes in different places, and I was informed that at a certain general election he contrived to vote in no fewer than 40 different places. At Federation, Australia mostly elected MPs using the comparatively fair method of first-past-the-post, restricting every voter to a single vote. It would not be until 1918 that the preferential voting system would be implemented. First-past-the-post has a natural effect of shaping the political landscape into a two-party system. For the first ten or so years after Federation, however, a three-party system emerged, inherited from New South Wales state politics. Representing the centre-right were two parties who disagreed on the issue of trade tariffs. They were the Free Trade Party and the Protectionist Party. Representing the left was the Australian Labour Party, who carved out enough seats to hold the balance of power, before choosing to form a coalition government with the Protectionist Party. Thus began a period of great instability, as allegiances rapidly shifted, supply was granted and retracted, most of all by the second Prime Minister, Alfred Deakin. Deakin's exploits have been superbly covered in two videos by Mr. M History, which I have linked to in the description, as I would be retreading ground by talking any more about it. 
It was not until 1910 that not only the first majority government in Australia, but the first majority Labour government in the world was elected. The amalgamation of the Free Trade Party, then having renamed itself to the Anti-Socialist Party, and the Protectionist Party, formed the Liberal Party, but not the same Liberal Party as today's Liberal Party. With the two-party system now in place, except for a few independent members, majorities were more reliable, with no minority governments occurring again until 1940. The 1940 election was the closest election in Australian history at that point, with both major parties ending up on 36 seats, two seats short of a majority. The existing Conservative government under Sir Robert Menzies was returned after guaranteeing support from two independents, Alexander Wilson and Sir Arthur Coles. I've discussed Sir Arthur at length previously, so if you'd like to hear more about him, I've linked to that video in the description. Though he sat as an independent, Wilson had been elected as the Victorian Country Party's candidate against the Federal Country Party's candidate and Wilson's cousin, Hugh McClelland. Sir Arthur's natural conservative leaning as a businessman led him to support Menzies, as well as his personal admiration for Menzies and the need for stability during the Second World War. Menzies discovered, as future Prime Minister Scott Morrison would, that the nation needed to see him at the helm in a time of crisis. Menzies, unlike Morrison, was not on holiday, but rather on official trips to Britain. Though Churchill said of him that he loathed his own people, he wants to be in England, you cannot hope to be PM of a people you don't like. He was already in a weakened position after the Canberra air disaster in 1940, in which three close allies of his had perished. At the same time, elements within the country party were plotting and sniping at Menzies, under the banner of Sir Earl Page, who had lost the leadership of the country party after refusing to serve under Menzies in 1939. On the 28th of August 1941, the issue came to a head in a party meeting. Menzies had seen that the numbers were against him, and once MP Bill McCall declared that he would take the first opportunity to defeat on the floor of the House any government of which he was the leader, Menzies resigned as leader and Prime Minister. The United Australia Party, the leadership of which Menzies had just resigned, went into a tailspin. The notional leadership of the party went to Billy Hughes, who had served in Parliament since Federation and was almost 80 years old at that point. The Prime Ministership went to the Deputy Prime Minister and leader of the Country Party, Arthur Fadden. For just over a month, Fadden led a rump government until the independents put the ailing coalition out of its misery, crossing the floor to support Labour's motion on the 3rd of October to reduce the budget by one pound. Fadden resigned and Labour formed government under John Curtin. In 1943, Labour won its largest victory in federal history with a two-party preferred vote of 58%. The UAP split and eventually dissolved. The Curtin and Chifley governments would see Labour continue in government until 1949, still the second longest continuous time in office for a Labour government. Menzies thought long and hard about quitting politics. He and his family had suffered immensely during the saga, and yet he struggled on. In 1944, he formed the Liberal Party, losing an election in 1946 before winning in 1949. He would go on to serve as Prime Minister until 1966, the longest serving by a margin of seven years. Eager to avoid the confusing spectacle of minority government, the Australian people would elect every subsequent government in majority until 2010. As I mentioned at the start, the 2010 election was incredibly close. Both major parties finished up on 72 seats, and the negotiations with the crossbenchers began in late August and lasted until the 7th of September, where the last independents, who had not yet chosen a side, did so. All three were former members of the National Party, however the trio broke 2-1 to one in favour of Labour, giving the government a two-seat majority though this majority only counted in matters of confidence and supply. While Labour had not gone to the opposition benches, the alternative wasn't much better. The government, under pressure from the Greens, broke one of the main promises of the election campaign, that they would not implement a carbon tax. There will be no carbon tax under the government I lead became a quotation with which opposition leader Tony Abbott would repeatedly beat down on the government. Independent MP Andrew Wilkie, who didn't have numbers in the Senate like the Greens, initially supported the Gillard government, but withdrew his support after the government failed to act on pokey reform, but not before receiving $340 million in funding for upgrades to the Royal Hobart Hospital. Similarly, independents Rob Oakeshott and Tony Windsor were able to secure road upgrades, hospital upgrades and sporting facilities and more for their traditionally safe national seats, which were often neglected in funding allocations. In a bid to shore up votes on the floor of the House, Labour Speaker Harry Jenkins Jr. stepped down and was replaced by LNP member Peter Slipper, who left the party on taking the speakership. The annual church service marks the start of the parliamentary year. Some churches are broader than others. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said, 
not everyone was clean. This is the word of the Lord. It's about I Judas think, and I, I, I the think, Last Supper. I think all of the readings are very good. What do you think about your readings? You, you have a lovely day. Slipper had taken the offer after support for his pre-selection at a branch level became unlikely. Slipper would later be implicated in misuse of funds and the alleged sexual harassment of James Ashby, who would go on to become Chief of Staff to Pauline Hanson. Other issues not related to the minority government situation also hurt the Gillard government. Labor backbencher Craig Thompson was implicated in the misuse of health services union funds, including for the solicitation of prostitutes. Kevin Rudd was also sniping at Gillard, widely believed to have been white-handing the government by leaking sensitive information. Rudd would challenge twice for the leadership of the Labour Party in the lead-up to the election of that year, being successful on the second attempt. Rudd served as Prime Minister again for seven months, before being swept away by the landslide victory of the coalition under Abbott, who won 90 of the 150 seats in the House of Reps. Tony Windsor and Rob Oakshaw, to the two MPs who had entered the stalemate by supporting Gillard, retired at the election. Barnaby Joyce, the Nationals MP replacing Windsor, pointed out in his book Weatherboard and Iron that Windsor's illness appeared in time for him to vacate his seat in 2013 when he was sure to lose, but it had cleared up in time for the 2016 election when the Turnbull government was on the ropes. Windsor failed to reclaim the seat in 2016. Since 2013, governments on both sides have rode very close to the line of minority government. The 2022 election saw the crossbench grow to 16 members, and it was only due to a superior performance in Western Australia that Labor was able to secure a three-seat majority. A larger crossbench, combined with the downward trend in the major party vote, means the governments of the future are more likely to be formed a minority. In 1935, after a period of relative banality compared to the first two decades of the 20th century, the Conservative government under the UAP's Sir Stanley Argyle was in the crosshairs for political betrayal. What is often forgotten about the Liberal Party is that it can rarely form a majority government on its own, instead needing to rely on its coalition with the National Party. The Nationals often like to throw their weight around and put out notions of dissolving the coalition if they don't get what they want, but they usually stop short of actually doing it. After the 1935 election, Victorian ALP Secretary Arthur Caldwell pitched the idea of a Labour national government to influential businessman John Wren, who used his connections with the Nationals to put the plan into action. The deputy leader of the Nationals, Albert Dunstan, was for the plan, and 13 days after the election became leader, after the outgoing leader declared his opposition to the plan. Once again, I appear to be retracing my steps, so allow me to quote myself discussing this event previously. Thirteen days after taking the offices of Leader of the Country Party and Deputy Premier, a motion was moved by Dunstan, which declared a want of confidence in the Argyle government. Argyle, after hearing the amusing and amazing speech by Dunstan, went on a tirade about how the Country Party had no claim to greater ministerial representation. A debate then ensued which went for 16 hours and constituted more than 120 pages of Hansard. The result was a resounding defeat of the Argyle government. A new government was formed, led by Dunstan, where the coalition parties were the Country Party and the Labour Party. Some policy concessions were made both ways as these strange bedfellows attempted to right the ship of government. Dunstan would go on to be one of Victoria's longest serving premiers, and his statue stands next to that of Sir Henry Bolte outside the Victorian Parliament. Bolte famously hated Dunstan for his betrayal of the UAP, and referred to him and his ilk as political prostitutes. The practice of building statues was started by Jeff Kennett, who became Premier of Victoria in 1992. After the collapse of the State Bank under Labor's Joan Kerner, Kennett repeated a similar result in 1996 and was preparing for a third term when, in 1998, he proposed the idea of statues for Premiers who held office for 3,000 days or more, a milestone he was soon to achieve. Sitting on a fairly comfortable majority, Kennett obviously had enough confidence in his ability to win to make this announcement. The fiscal conservatism of Kennett had seen cuts to programs and services, particularly in rural areas. Labour went out and campaigned in these rural areas, even going as far as to launch their campaign in Ballarat. Despite these areas being unusual targets for Labour, they managed to carve into Kennett's rural seats, reclaiming several losses of 1992 and even breaking new ground in strong Liberal territory. The election ended up with neither side having a majority, 
and three independents waiting to see who they would throw their support behind, proposing a charter of changes they wanted in order to guarantee their support. On election day, a candidate for the electoral district of Frankston East died of a heart attack. Per legislation, the election was rerun in a supplementary election a month later, where Labour won resoundingly. As Wikipedia points out, regardless of who won in Frankston East, neither the Coalition nor Labour could form a government without the support of the independents, leaving them in a position to effectively choose the next Premier. Though this is true, if Labour had lost the supplementary election, even with the support of the three independents, they would only have been able to match the coalition at 44 seats apiece. In the negotiations with the independents, Labour was more willing to implement the independents' charter. Couple this with the nature of the independents, who weren't all necessarily pro-Labour, but, as Labour leader Steve Brax recalled, their antipathy towards the Kennett government was so strong it was practically unbelievable. In the end, Labour was able to secure the support of the crossbenchers, giving them a two-seat majority. Demands from the independents like reforms to the upper house to implement proportional representation, the restoration of the independence of the Auditor General, and reforms to freedom of information requests were accepted by the incoming Labour government. Though when you google Brax FOI reforms, the first result is a story called Brax stands by decision to block FOI documents, using the same loophole the Liberals had been using to shield documents from view by attaching them to cabinet documents, thus rendering them cabinet in confidence. One of the points that is often made to caution the electorate against voting in a way that could result in a minority government is that minority governments are inherently unstable. The argument against that is that the oldest government in Australia has been in minority since 2001, excepting a brief period of majority from 2004 to 2008. The Australian Capital Territory Government has been composed of the Australian Labor Party in coalition with the Greens for that period. Not only is this government stable, it's electorally effective. Six election wins in a row, even in a jurisdiction with a naturally progressive bent like the ACT, is notable. As a coalition government, ministries are shared between Labour and the Greens. Unlike the stinging conflicts that occur between the Greens and Labour at a federal level, the ACT's coalition is positively cordial. So much so, in fact, that elements within the Greens have become irritated at the amiability of the relationship. Former MLA Carolyn Lacuda citing concerns that by taking on ministries and the government, their policies get reduced to a green-tinged ALP government and they then have to publicly defend whatever the government does. The issue becomes more difficult as the ACT Liberals become less and less viable. In 2022, the ACT Liberals failed to elect a senator for the first time since 1975. From extreme friendliness to extreme hostility, we now look at the relationship between the Greens and Labour in Tasmania after the 1996 election. The incumbent Liberal government lost three seats, which Labour picked up, and the Greens were left with the balance of power. Common sense would dictate that these two parties of the left and centre-left ought to form a coalition government. But the Labour Party, under Michael Field, had declared that it would only govern a majority. The Liberal Party had made the same commitment, and so the three parties were at an impasse. Today, governments will declare they will govern a majority and make no plans for concessions, and then pick up the phone to anyone who will listen and offer them anything they want if there are a chance to form government. In 1996, however, Labour wasn't lying. They steadfastly refused to form government with the Greens. The Liberals, having been put in a position where they should have lost government, instead decided to form government with the Greens, after replacing the leader who had committed not to. Labour would return to majority government after the next election. Minority governments are often presented as dangerous. Is there not a danger inherent in giving a government too much legislative power? Today, most governments, even a majority, still have to negotiate. Upper houses around the country, the houses of review, are pretty much impossible to win a majority in, with major party primary votes and proportional representation being what they are. Conservative governments are generally unhappy in minority, and unhappy with the idea of minority government, as Sir Robert Menzies was in 1940 and Jeff Kennett was in 1999. Comparatively, Labour seems better suited to balance the needs of their own government, the crossbenchers, and their public appearance such as, again, in the 1999 Victorian election, which would lead Labour towards their strongest result in state history in 2002. Of course, the lessons of 2010 and appearing too collaborative, among other things, were well learned by federal Labour, who now seldom miss an opportunity to have a legislative punch-on with the Greens. Another theme of minority governments is the strange bedfellows they make. The Labour National Coalition of 1935 and the Liberal Green Coalition in 1996 are obvious examples, though those were exceptional circumstances. As I mentioned earlier, minority governments are likely to become more prevalent. In 2007, the major parties control 85% of the vote federally. Last year, it was down to just 68.5%. This trend has been going on for quite some time, and is likely to continue. 
Today, there are two minority governments in the nine Australian jurisdictions. In Tasmania, Premier Jeremy Rockliffe stands two seats short of the majority after two Liberal MPs became independents over disagreements with the Premier's AFL stadium plan. The situation in Tasmania is unstable, and questions have been asked as to whether the present government will be able to continue going forward. Meanwhile, the other minority government in Australia is the newly minted New South Wales Labor government. Comparatively, the Minsk government is in a much happier position. They are also two seats short of majority, but the Legislative Assembly of New South Wales has 93 members, while the Tasmanian House of Assembly has 25. Not only that, but with a large crossbench, they have plenty of legislative paths to choose from, either working with the Greens for more progressive legislation, or with two of the many independents for more centrist or conservative legislation. One of the features of minority government is the ability of crossbenchers to force change that may not have occurred otherwise. The carbon tax and Victoria's upper house region system, for better or for worse, were brought to us by minority governments. People often point to the high volume of legislation passed by the Gillard government and declare it an effective government. Now, while quantity does not imply quality, the negotiations that were necessary to pass those acts almost certainly resulted in improvements. Steve Brax concluded his chapter in his book on his negotiations with the independents with these words. The independents I've dealt with quickly form the view that they are not the government and they don't represent the government. They represent their electorates. They stand for a body of views that they have put to their electorate and that is mostly what they want to achieve in supporting a particular government. Their priority is to accomplish important things for the people that they represent, rather than for the whole of the state or the whole of their country. I think most independents embrace that philosophy. <clears throat> There's an election on in Flinders, and I know who I will back. It's a hard-working man called Kata. Helps anyone on the track. From Kainuna to the Towers, from Greenvale to the Creek, you can all be very sure, bubble working eight day week. I know, and I hope you know it too. I can assure you, Bob Catter Jr. will do the best for you.